Hi, welcome into the ranch. First time here for everybody? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Joshua. I'm the park interpreter here. And our house is set up in a couple different ways. You're welcome to go through the house on your own. There's a couple self-guided options for that. Uh, I would actually recommend starting here at the bookshelf if you'd like to do it that way. What I like about the bookshelf is it's chronologically ordered, top to bottom, left to right. If you take the time to read through all the captions, it'll give a good overview of the five major owners that had this property from 1876 to 1972. If you also, though, would rather watch, there is a movie in the back room behind the kitchen area there, beyond the ovens and the stoves or a doorway. It's obscured by the china hut. You just can't see it yet. And that film plays for about a seven-minute loop. I prefer the bookshelf because you'll get to see pictures of the people that is lacking in the film. Would you all like a personal tour of the home? Yes, please. Oh, wonderful. Great. Well, cool. I was bored, so come on over. So, I like to start my tour here at the bookshelf. What I like about the bookshelf, again, is we get to meet our families. We get to meet the people who own it. And again, if you have any questions throughout this, let me know. I'm happy to help. And please don't feel free to bad interrupting me. So, our property, Spring Mountain Ranch, is homesteaded back in 1876. Some of the oldest buildings we'll see on property date back to that time. However, the human history here goes back much farther. At least 10,000 years ago, pre-Clovis people were here. These are people who were hunting megafauna. These are large animals like the Columbian mammoth or the dire wolf or the saber-toothed cats or the giant ground sloths. These animals are now extinct as well as the people who were here at that time. But other different indigenous groups have made their mark here. After the pre-Clovis people is a group called the Desert Archaic Group. That is a name that anthropologists give to a lot of different people that we don't know much about. Who here has ever seen a pictograph or a petroglyph here in our community? I have. I like raising my hand when I answer questions. Um, we see a lot of pictographs and petroglyphs from this period, the Desert Archaic period, and we just don't know what they mean. That is because these languages are lost and these aren't actually written languages the way hieroglyphics are in other places. That group, the Desert Archaic, leads to the Patean group, which leads to the Anasazi. The Anasazi are the group that is here when the Southern Paiute finally make their way here. And the Southern Paiute is the group that is still with us today, the indigenous group that you will find two reservations in our area, one in downtown Las Vegas and the other out by Valley of Fire, the Moapa Band of Paiute. The Paiutes actually play a story in our history as well. In 1876, and you can pick these up, this is a great way to bring them around to visitors, we see this guy here, James Wilson, and a business partner named George Anderson start this property under the name Sandstone Ranch. Sandstone Ranch is founded as a fruit and vegetable farm. James, after having served in the Civil War and trying his hand at mining, decides to come here to Las Vegas and start a ranch. His first ranch is actually in the Las Vegas Springs, which is now modern day Springs Preserve. And after being unable to acquire the water rights for that, he comes to this property and starts it in 1876. James's business partner, George Anderson, had two sons, a stepson named Jim Jr. and a biologic son named Tweed. And both the boys are left behind at a young age. After the mother and the father have passed away, James adopts these two men and brings them in as his own. In 1906, when James passes away, these two men are deeded the ranch and they become the owners. From 1906 to 1929, they're fairly successful with their cattle operation, and they're able to acquire both status and wealth as cattle operators. But unfortunately, in 1929, they are forced to sell the property. They sell the property then to a man named Willard George. Before I go too far, though, I would like to talk about these last two pictures, since we're referencing them right now. Tweed had two sons. We see right here, Buster, and we see Boone. Buster and Boone, represent really the last generation of the Wilsons that would have called this ranch home. Buster and Boone, as well as Tweed and Jim Jr. and James Wilson are all buried on property. We have a cemetery on property right behind where our lake area is, and that's where you'll find all three, uh, all three generations, all five men that represent the Wilson era. The last picture we see here is Buster Wilson here at the ranch. Buster is very important to our story here, not only as the last Wilson, but also to the house that we're standing in. He was responsible for both the stonework and the brickwork that we see in the home today. And here is Buster holding a fox. This is not a pet. You'll notice that it actually has a chain hanging from it. This would have been caught for fur. It was an animal that he would have skinned for fur. 
And this is important, the connection of fur that the Wilsons had to our next owner, Willard George, who we see here with the top hat. That's his young son, Hampton, right here. And that road is actually Highway 159. Not a highway there yet, but currently the highway that you would have driven in on today to come to the ranch. Willard George is a fur maker to the stars in Hollywood. He is dressing stars like Rita Hayworth, Greta Garbo, Lucille Ball, and others, including Ginger Rogers, who we see right here in his advertisement. Willard George's shop, which was on Wilshire Boulevard, was a very well-known and reputable shop. This made it difficult for Willard to own and operate the ranch, so he becomes really our first absentee owner, living in Los Angeles and spending really not a whole lot of time here. He actually allows these two men to stay on property for free for the rest of their life and does that for two reasons. One, it's a pragmatic thing. Willard, again, isn't here to run a ranch, so who else better to run the ranch than the two men who have lived here their whole life and know about it? But the other reason is a family connection. In the picture that we see here, we see James, we see Jim Jr., sorry, we see Jim Jr. and Tweed in the picture. We see an unnamed dog, but in this bottom corner, you'll see there's a small child in the corner of that picture. That young child is Willard George, the Hollywood fur maker that would later come back and buy the ranch in 1929. Willard George spends his summer months here at the ranch, and during that time, these two men pass on a lot of knowledge to him. They teach him fluent Southern Paiute. They also teach him how to hunt and trap animals, and most importantly, how to skin them. He takes that knowledge, that Southern Paiute heritage, and runs with it, and by 1929 has established enough wealth and success that he can actually give this ranch back to these two men. Again, he allows them to live here for free for the rest of their natural lives. It's a very generous thing to do. That makes Willard my favorite owner. Everybody's dead, so I can have a favorite. Nobody gets jealous. It's okay. Humor's a good thing, right? So, Willard George is responsible for a majority of the buildings that we see on property. When we look across from the ranch house later, when we go into those rooms and off to the back porch, we look across and we'll see those white buildings, including the chinchilla shed and the spring house. Those buildings are built during the fur maker's era, Willard George's era. Willard George, however, by 1944, has basically outgrown the property and decides to lease it with an option to buy to his friend, Chester Locke. We see Chet here with a horse. That dress belt that he is wearing is actually on display in the saddle case back there, so that's worth taking a look at once we're done here. And Chet is the man who really finalizes the shape of the ranch that we see today. The road that you drove in on is first graded into the desert by Chet. It was a dirt road then. The parking lot that you parked at, those corrals, were codified and basically established by Chet. The three-acre pond, which is one of the defining features of our property, is built by Chet, as well as this ranch house, as well as the final shape of all the pasture land. So really, the shape of the ranch we see today is Chet's. Now, Chet, like I said, is responsible for building this ranch house, and he acquires this property and builds this home as a vacation retreat. His radio program, Lum and Abner, which was played across the country for about 25 years nightly, affords him the wealth and success to buy this ranch as a retreat. We actually are listening to Lum and Abner on the radio right now as we speak. He builds the house as a vacation retreat, so when we're asked who lived here, I usually don't say Chet. He actually lived in Los Angeles and just came here with his family to get away from the city to escape, like what you were all doing today. Chet builds this house, though, with some pretty interesting features, a lot of reclaimed material. The sandstone blocks that make up the main room here, which initially is just this main room, these rooms don't exist until a later owner. Those sandstone blocks are mostly salvaged from buildings that had already been built and fallen into disrepair. Because sandstone has to be chiseled and cut by hand from the big slabs on down, you can save a lot of time and money salvaging those blocks. Some of the pieces were carved, though, at the sandstone quarry, which is the third stop on the Red Rock Canyon Scenic Drive. And some of the pieces were even fashioned here on property. We have a small quarry site off trail behind us. Chetlock also salvages a lot of the wood from the home, including these large beams above our head, the beams that go over the wallway, walls and the doorways, and a majority of the wood that makes up this west wing of the house where we have upstairs two bedrooms and a bathroom, and downstairs two bedrooms and a bathroom. Most of this salvaged lumber comes from Henderson. We have a small little sister city to the southeast, Henderson, Nevada, that starts its history as a company town based around a magnesium plant called the Basic Magnesium Plant. 
the end of World War II, the plant is shuttered. There is no need for it anymore, and Henderson starts to go into debt. So they tear apart this factory, massive factory, and check, hears about all this lumber for sale, goes out and buys that lumber for really pennies on the dollar and brings it back to the site to begin construction of the house. The final piece of salvage material is the brick in the fireplace, as well as the brick in the kitchen area. Chet and Harriet lived in Los Angeles during the building of this home, and Harriet was an interior designer in Hollywood. She wanted this house to have a rustic, an aged, and patinaed feel the day they moved in. She did not want new brick. Lucky for them, there were buildings being torn down in Los Angeles that were about 100 years older than that period, so we're looking at buildings from the gold rush. These buildings are torn down and the brick is being thrown away. Harriet and Chet salvage all of that brick and have it shipped here by rail and then by truck to the site. We estimate that it cost them quite a bit more to do that than buy new brick, but they wanted the age to look. That patina was very important. I think it's a nice characteristic. I can see where Harriet was coming from on that take. There's some other features in the house that are kind of Hollywoodish. A good thing to point out is the oven area, the kitchen area. You'll see what look like coal chutes or wood chutes underneath the stoves. Those are actually just for show. There never would have been a wood burning fire or a coal burning fire under there. What they actually had were tanks of butane, gas tanks that essentially ran copper appliances that are unfortunately no longer with us. One of the other features that's sort of just for show is also the turret above the house. When you came in, there's this beautiful dove coat in the exterior. It is right where that light is. It is just for show. But this was Chet and Harriet's dream house. This was their vacation home. This was their dream vacation home. And you can't blame them with incredible views like this. Speaking of views, when Chet and Harriet were here, the front room was just a little bit different. This room that's open off to the side of me did not exist yet, and this was actually one of the two front doors of the home. The other front door was the door on the other side of the fireplace, the other French door. And the idea being, anywhere you sat in this house, you could have mountain views both north and south. Chet and his family outgrow the property, and by 1955, it is bought by a German movie actress named Vera Krupp. We see a picture of Vera here on property. Here she is with one of her many pets, a little kitty cat, as well as her favorite horse, Sweetheart. But something to note is Vera's large engagement ring. A 33 plus carat diamond ring given to her by her fourth and final husband. When we are asked who lived in this home, we can honestly say only one person, Vera. Vera is the only person to ever live in this building full time on property. Vera lives here during the summer months really without air conditioning, which is a pretty drastic thing to do. So to make that more comfortable, she does some changes to the home. She creates doorways that were new to the home to open up airflow. But most notably, she creates a swimming pool back here. After creating the swimming pool, she also encloses this space as a swimmer's room, and she also encloses that area as an extra entertaining space, essentially a sunroom. Vera's story is very colorful. She's married four times. She is actually a baroness of that 33 karat diamond ring, as well as $700 in cash, a revolver, and a camera. The robbers escape. Vera and her manager, who were eating dinner together, struggle free of the bindings they were placed in. And the men are eventually apprehended six weeks later by the FBI in New Jersey. The diamond is recovered in New Jersey, although the setting and the two baguettes on either side are not with it at the time. Eventually the baguettes are recovered, but the setting, I believe, is never recovered. Look at my history buff over there. Was the, I missed that part. Was the setting ever recovered? Oh, excuse me. Was the setting of the diamond ring ever recovered? No. That's what I thought. Okay. You mean the, the platinum? Yeah. No, that was flushed. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought I heard. <laughs> um, I'm trying not to I'm trying to use all the good information. <laughs> so Vera is uh, shook by that. She loved the peace and quiet and isolation of the ranch, but that really changes her psychology. She becomes fearful. She's worried that now she's a target out here, a single woman with lots of wealth. So she does a couple things. She does hire a full-time security guard who lives on property, not in the building, but on property. But most notably, she actually becomes deputized. She becomes a spare sheriff's special deputy. And we're actually lucky enough to have her badge on display in this room. The swimmer's room is a great room to walk around in because you'll actually get a chance to see a lot of Vera's property in there. It's very interesting. Vera, though, unfortunately, by the late 1960s, 1965, has grown ill from diabetes. And she moves back to Los Angeles and by 1967 has sold the property to the Howard Hughes Tool Corporation. 
We don't believe that Howard Hughes himself ever sets foot on property during his ownership of the ranch. While he is our most notable owner, I would argue he is frankly our least important owner. Of all the changes made and all the things that happen here, Hughes is the most hands-off of all of our owners and very little occurs here. The things that do occur are actually pretty much in this front room. The original two-inch tongue and groove pine floor is removed, a concrete slab is put down, and blue shag carpet is placed throughout the front room. Yeah, 1967, right? <laughs> the other thing that is altered is the kitchen. Uh, when we look in the kitchen today, the modern electrical appliances we see, including the refrigerator and the dishwasher, are placed by the Howard Hughes Corporation. Sorry, the Hughes Corporation. The electrical appliances replace these beautiful copper appliances that the Locke family had put in that were gas powered. The Hughes Corporation, we understand, uses this ranch primarily as a vacation retreat for the executives. Because of Hughes' health conditions, his agoraphobia and germophobia, as well as the lack of evidence, no pictures or written testimonies or oral histories that corroborate him here, we just seem, it seems very unlikely, if not uh, completely impossible, improbable that he would have been here at that time. The Hughes Corporation owns the property for five years, 1967 to 1972. And by 1972, they have outgrown the property as well. They're looking at it as fat, so they basically trim the fat and they sell it to our final owners, Fletcher Jones and William Murphy. Fletcher Jones and William Murphy are two business developers, also car salesmen, and their plan was to turn this into a high-density subdivision. They were going to put around 1,000 homes out here. The entire landscape would have been changed. All the historic structures, including this building, would have been demolished as well as the cabins that date back to the 1860s, which are now some of the oldest buildings still standing in the state of Nevada. Lucky for us though, people like you all, who are interested in things like this, protested enough that the Clark County Commission in 1973 denies the request to rezone this property for that type of development. And the men at that time decide to sell it. And they sell it to the state of Nevada for about three and a half million dollars. It's a very controversial purchase at that time. In today's value, that's roughly $15 million. And at that time, it was very unpopular. We actually have a letter signed by the then Lieutenant Governor, Harry Reid, stating that this ranch is a giant waste of money. Hindsight's 2020. We are very lucky that this has been saved. This ranch represents a great continuum of history that Las Vegas and other parts of our community has lost. We are the third oldest ranch ever founded in Vegas back in 1876. And we are now the last remaining ranch you can publicly visit that's in pristine condition. When you walk back outside those doors today, depending on what side of the ranch you're looking at, you could be transported back 50, 100 to 150 years ago. And things really haven't changed that much. And we pride ourselves on that. We want to be able to share this local history of this amazing community with all of you to come out. Uh, state parks, we are a middle-aged state park. And we are a rare state park because we don't have camping, boating, fishing, and hunting. We really focus on history. And we have some beautiful hiking trails that are out and about. We have three total hiking trails that cover about four and a half miles. Um, so at that point, what I recommend for all my visitors is to go ahead and make a time, go through the house, explore on your own. I really like this room, don't want to miss this room. There's also a back room behind the movie, behind the kitchen area where the movies plays. There's some great exhibits back there as well. Uh, normally I would give a tour of these back rooms as well, but I've got some maintenance professionals working on my HVAC unit back there, so they got a lot of stuff all over the floor, I don't want to get anybody hurt.